Okay, um, I'm gonna start. Uh, I'll talk a bit about new radio hardware acceleration using the Silink Sync platform. Uh, so I'll first try to motivate a bit how I came up with this idea or how how I ended up doing it. Uh, then I'll talk a bit about how things are right now, a bit about the development experience. I think not everyone's an FPGA designer, maybe not everyone's a software developer. Most of you are hackers, so probably you did a bit of both. And then I'll just summarize. So, about me, um, I'm a full-time engineer with Edis Research, the USORP guys. Uh, also, I'm finishing my master degree, which is how I ended up with this project in the beginning, because I needed a thesis subject, so I figured why not do something that's fun, right? Uh, in the GNU radio project, I did some random patches. Uh, I break stuff. I put Fortran into GNU radio with GR spec S. Uh, yeah, over the last summer, I worked on the Zinc stuff. So, why would you do that, right? I mean, people right now we do awesome stuff with SDR. We have LTE. We have we have really cool things, satellite downlinks, really interesting stuff. We saw a lot of cool stuff here on desktop PCs, on laptops. But no one uses mobile SDRs. No one has something to put in your pocket and just be a base station in your pocket, right? That would be awesome. <laughs> so um, the problem is embedded systems are usually either slow or built for exactly one thing. So if they're not slow, they come with an ASIC or a DSP that just does one thing and the whole thing is designed to do this one thing and nothing else. So uh, another thing is like embedded is harder than just software development on a normal PC because you got to cross compile debugging. It's not so much fun. Uh, you end up playing with UARTs and stuff. So uh, let's step back one. Let's get one step back. Why? I mean, the normal new radio workflow. You saw it today several times. You have like your new radio companion. So you, you start by understanding your algorithm, you, you draw, drag together some blocks, you end up with something that works, and then you see if it's fast enough, and if it's fast enough, you're done. Okay? This, this worked pretty well because people are doing awesome stuff. So how can we get this to, to an embedded platform? I mean, recent developments, Silinx came up with this sort of chip that's technically nothing new, it's, it's just a ARM core with some FPGA and some fast fabric in between. But it's it's a really interesting product because there's a lot of development going on, a lot of stuff gets upstreamed in the kernel. Um, their, their tools, the Silinx tools are actually pretty horrible, but <laughs> the other stuff Stop is... Being polite. Just saying. <laughs> so, so the other stuff is uh, pretty good. Actually, there's a lot of documentation, so it's an interesting platform for us. And also, I, one thing I forgot to say, it, it's interesting because it, the integration of the ARM and the FPGA allows you to stay still somewhat software defined because, I mean, in, in a wider sense, HDLs are still software that you're able to control what happens with the hardware. So, the radio and FPGAs, so the, those were kind of the, the questions that I had in mind when I worked on this. And it's like, how can we integrate FPGAs that are sort of completely different from what we do in GNU Radio into the workflow that people using GNU Radio are used to. And uh, which parts of what I'm doing should end up in GNU Radio and what changes do we make to GNU Radio to make that happen? So this is roughly the plan. We have this ARM processor in there that has this neon instructions we use for bulk. And uh, we want this to use the FPGA, but uh, we want the users not to worry about all the gory details. Not everyone wants to write the curl driver just to do some FPGA fun, right? And um, like the hardware guys, they don't want to deal with C++. It's horrible, right? So you don't want to do this. If you're a hardware designer, you want to do Verilog or VHDL. So you basically give both sides a known interface they they know how to develop against which will in the end allow both sides to to just integrate stuff into GNU radio w without really dealing with the other side 
and the thing would do the plumbing in between. So, like what I would define as an accelerator is basically a coprocessor in the sink. You have this ACP port, which is cache coherent, so it allows the FPGA fabric access to the host's memory. And, um, well, the idea is to sort of imitate the work method idea we have in GNU Radio. So we, because in GNU Radio you don't care about where your samples come from into your block and where they go after you're done with them. You just care about, I have this bunch of samples, I process them and let GNU Radio do the copying or whatever it does with it. I don't care because I just want to implement my DSP algorithm that does times two, for example. So, yeah, you want to make it exchangeable by having this sort of fixed interface. So also, before getting started with this whole thing, you've got to deal with all this kind of stuff. Uh, you got to have access to debug your hardware and everything, and well, this should be well documented for people to make it easy to start and fill, and other people in the project already worked on a lot of stuff to make building new radio easy and everything. Um, well, usually someone needs to do the low-level kernel development, happened to be me in this case, so I did it. Uh, one thing we learned at Edges Research from <coughs> developing software radios is like move as much as smarts to the user land and leave the kernel to do interrupts and whatever, right? So the goals I had were hide the low-level hacking, uh, provide a managed buffer interface like UHD, People that worked with UHD know it based. I will show how it works later. Uh, you want flexibility so you can easily expand stuff. And you want to avoid boilerplate. You don't want to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite the same stuff. One thing with the sync thing is that the arm is not so fast in itself, so you gotta leave it alone as much as possible and let it deal with what it's good at, like scheduling and running the radio, but you don't want to bother it with a lot of load through interrupts or to, through processing. So a few words about the kernel module. It's it's a really slim layer basically. It allocates buffers. It it sort sort of it's horrible. It doesn't do scatter gather, so it just grabs a bunch of memory at boot time and just maps it to user land. Uh, we map the control registers to user land and um, it handles IRQs and all the kind of stuff you don't want to deal with. And it's completely agnostic of the algorithm. It doesn't care what your accelerator does. It basically just moves data. And it does zero copy. So what are managed buffers for people that don't know UHD? Managed buffers are kernel allocated buffers. In, in this case, through the ACP port we're using here, they're cache coherent. Uh, the burst size is variable, so you can make transfers as you need them. The reference counted on automatic submitted. We'll see that later. And so the idea in radio is you're always dealing with those streams. So you have a bunch of samples, they come into your block, you do something, and there's another stream that goes out of your block. Or you have tags, but let's ignore that for now. And um, so you create one transport to receive, one transport to transmit, and those transport are used to submit buffers to the device and get them back. And you can ask for the buffers using poll or read or whatever, a sane interface to use the land. So uh, once the buffer goes out of scope, it automatically gets submitted, which is cool because you're using shared pointers, you pass it around in your application, and once you're done, off it. once the last reference goes out of scope, you're done. So it's really a, a real high level. I mean, this was the goal, basically. Input stream, you write your HDL code, or you, you drag and drop something that Silings provides you to do it. And that's it. I mean, you can do that, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's the code. Basically, that's all you need to do if you want to send data or receive data. So you create the transports. Uh, you have some C++. Uh, you create the send or receive transports. Here I created this artificial scope. Uh, this gives me this shared pointer to a buffer. I can specify a timeout or just pull if I'm really eager to have data and you see what once I, I reach this point the buffer uh, the whole thing goes out of scope and the driver just submits it to the device and things just happen so 
usually when designing hardware you have like a specification then you do a fixed point software implementation if you deal with DSP algorithms then you code it in HDL you simulate you integrate and you debug I mean you shouldn't have to debug because you simulate it right but uh, so for my case uh, I used Python because I'm lazy so I didn't do the whole old school C implementation um, and you can do all of this using free software up to this point um, then for, for Verilog I used Verilator for simulation which allows me to write uh, C++ test benches instead of dealing with Verilog uh, I have some code that's yet unreleased and uh, I'm hoping to push it that will even allow you to test your stuff from inside your radio by wrapping very very low code into C++ and wrapping that again into Python and then you have this block that does the same thing as your hardware cycle accurate uh, yeah it's so this generates uh, when you run your test benches this looks usually like this here for the project I work on could look like this simplified so um once you're done with the whole simulation thing, you integrate with the rest of the hardware, everything works. You adapt interfaces maybe and you optimize for timing and synthesis. So looking at hardware goals I had in mind when doing this project, you want to use an interface people know, something that's easy to use that and that's widespread. So um, you want to have a interface that fits the streaming model I explained before. So. Uh, should be vendor independent so even though this was targeted to sync you also want to use the Altera sock or whatever at one point in the future and again with the whole FPGA stuff comes a whole lot of boilerplate ugly tickle scripts silings uh, graphical interfaces you name it horrible so I went with Axie Stream because that's what we use at Atlas Research and it's also what Silinx uses for a lot of IP so you can just basically take an FFT or fur filter, drag it in there in the box where it says your HDL here, connect it and compile it and yeah that's basically it. So Axie Stream works, basically you have a slave and a master or an input or an output and they do some kind of handshake which allows the slave your, your block to say okay back off I need time to calculate and once you're good for the next sample you just assert the ready signal and get the next block of data you have a large amount of IP already in an open course on github also uh, proprietary ones from Xilinx um, it allows for frames bursts and it's vendor independent so it also works on other FPGAs so go back to the simple example, you have your HDL code here. So the very log boilerplate for this looks like this. So basically this is input input description and module and here you write what you actually want to do with the samples. The simplest case would be to just connect it and do nothing. That wouldn't be useful, but yeah. So it's really not a lot of boilerplate and you can auto generate that. So for my master thesis I needed a good justification why I do all this because it's fun, it's not a good reason for universities. So uh, <laughs> I worked on uh, log map max SISO, that's soft input, soft output, uh, maximum map posterior decoder. It's uh, basically something like a turbo decoder. And it works on soft input, soft outputs. Uh, outputs at the moment, hard decision bits, but could also output soft decision bits if you want to. And in order to make this thing work, I coded the whole thing up in HDL in Verilog from scratch because it was one of my three test cases. And I wanted to test my thing against like how a user would actually do it. So to adapt the whole thing to my use case here, I just had to change the transfer sizes in user land to, to basically do a transfer of one frame length for my decoder, that's it. So no, no specific code needed in my my code that actually interfaces with it except for saying I want this much data per transfer going in or out so it's gonna be on github at one point uh, technically my thesis was handed in today 
<laughs> because I uh, put the wrong date on it. So, um, yeah. So the issues we have right now is uh, that the DMA engine inside is Silinx proprietary. Um, we're working on replacing that with a completely open source, open course uh, DMA engine that can do scatter gather and basically does the same thing in less space, less amount, and everything's better. Uh, you saw right now it doesn't feel really GNU Radio-ish. It's, it's completely not how GNU Radio should feel. So that's still an issue. And um, What happened after or in parallel, it sort of overlapped. Jonathan Pendlum did the GSOC with the GNU Radio project and he did a tremendous effort to document how to use this kind of stuff because I'm horrible at documenting and doing slides as you can see and he did a really great wiki page that explains how to go all through the horribleness with the Xilinx tools, how to generate bootloaders and how to get open embedded running and he provided an example using an FIR filter and he even benchmarked it so I mean you can really see the improvement it's uh, there's a significant difference in, in runtime by offloading an FIR filter in one of the examples we have in radio to the FPGA. So uh, there's basically three use cases where, or test cases I had to try that this actually works and sort of feels okay. But uh, I mean, there, there's still a lot of work to do. It's, it's really not an easy task to do because they're like integrating this into new radio in a way that that works for a lot of cases is not so easy because say you have two blocks behind each other uh, that work on samples so you have this stream so you don't want to copy to the device go back to the host and go copy back to the device so at the moment GNU Radio is not able to deal with this because there's this well we don't have the concept of this so we had discussions and um, like having domains where new radio scheduler somehow figures out those all those blocks belong somewhere and uh, there are other people trying to add DSPs and interface them with with uh, ARM cores so for them it's a completely different use case because for an FPJ you need to synthesize your image it's not just and you have something else whereas with a DSP you can just load different code and execute a different function just like this and reconfigure the code and it's a lot more flexible, so finding a model that works for all those kind of accelerators is not an easy task. And I'm, I'm probably going to uh, propose some Google Summer of Code project this year with something similar because I would like to see this continue this effort and as I work now I don't have this, the same amount of time to uh, spend on fun projects like this. Um, I guess that's more or less it. Are there questions except for where is the code? <laughs> I got one. All right. You said earlier that uh, you really want to have the heavy work done on the FPGA only yes. and don't want to stress the, uh, the ARM so much. Does it work that you, for a like, reasonable amount of um, radio or waveform you want to implement, that you need all of them? All uh, models, all blocks in the FPGA. Oh, so, so I did some benchmarking. What I observed is I get really good throughput and everything. If I just put the loopback 5 in there, I can bang like 800, 900 megabytes per second through there and get it back and no problem. The moment I do anything in the arm actually processing, this all goes to shit. So <laughs> basically what, what needs to happen is you need to leave the arm alone with everything. Mm. and let it to run the scheduler and make use of the NEON instructions but you want to do I mean even even if you don't get an acceleration by using the FPGA already not having the arm do it is like a gigantic performance benefit because it can do other stuff yeah. at this point. You can also schedule blocks in parallel in the FPGA so you essentially have a many core system. Mm. Yeah but I mean like for instance putting moderns uh, of the M particle plus. Uh, well, that would basically mean having all the modules. Yes, you'd have to code them yeah. somehow in HDL, which would be a tremendous effort. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what you, I mean, as previously said, you don't you don't optimize unless you have a performance issue. So 
what you would do is you, you benchmark the thing you profile and you see this is the block that eats my cycles and then you look at which part of this block is slow and then if you can't figure something out you put this block yeah. in the FPGA. So. And hopefully eventually you end up building up an open source library of these blocks yes. to, to usually replace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you would end up having old blocks for the pool of HGL. Yeah, I guess eventually. <laughs> that would be nice, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, I mean, the blocks are already there to see. It shouldn't be that hard to get some behavioral HDL out of it that then somehow the synthesizer hopefully makes it into something sensible. That might be true, yeah. Well, that's if you want to meet timing or something, that's a different I'm story. I'm not talking about <laughs> timing yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you tried to uh, run the setting of uh, VHL coder? No, I don't do VHDL by, 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 I don't believe in VHDL sort of. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those Emacs very long, uh, Emacs swim things, so. It's an East Coast, West Coast thing. Yeah, also. <laughs> yeah, but you, don't, you, don't, you don't always want to run everything on the FPGA, like, you, say you have something very signal processing specific that takes up a lot of your time, that's a perfect job for the FPGA. And, but then, in that case, you'll most likely find something on open cores or in the, the Silex library. And um, then, the actual coding effort is, isn't really that big. Like, say this would were part of GNU Radio, um, like <laughs> it would be really easy. Like, you in GNU Radio, you define this is going to be an FPGA communicating block, and then you drop your drop your open core thing into the um, into the space <coughs> from the FPGA, and there you are. And you you don't want to do everything always on the FPGA. I mean, on the um, embedded system, obviously, like you don't want to um, stress the arm, but there's some things. Um, that like general, generally are much nicer to implement on um, uh, a GPU. Like if you have some weird, I don't know, states or something, that's a bad example. Oh, say you do a Viterbi that's awesome for FPGAs. It's yeah. basically made for, I mean, it's it made for it's being implemented based. in hardware, right? So. Yeah, exactly. And then you have other stuff that's completely horrible. Oh, and I, did, I, I forgot to say that that's also important because, uh, so, as the FPGA does does work with fixed point, you need to convert. So, uh, like some weeks ago, uh, I also finished converters that do the conversion from float to fixed in hardware. So that's also taken care of, which didn't enter the benchmark. So, basically, now you can. I I mean, on normal devices, you're usually banned with limited in terms of how much data you can get in there, and you wouldn't want to do float over the wire because you need to transfer more data, but my benchmark showed me basically that I have unlimited bandwidth to the FPJ in terms of what the ARM could actually produce as data. So that's between main <coughs> memory, yes, main yes. memory and the FPJ. Yes. So. Uh, can you tell us? My question is that can you tell us the motivation behind choosing the Zinc platform uh, as a hardware accelerator? Maybe a DSP platform or a GPU could have helped uh, in this regard. And the reason why I'm saying GPUs is because we have these Mali GPUs along which come with uh, ARM SOCs. So ARM plus GPU instead of ARM plus FPGA. This will also reduce, I believe, the coding effort as well. So. Well, so so one of the reasons was obviously because I had this hardware at my hands. So I mean, if you go and buy me a board with an ARM and a Mali CPU on it, you you could could Chromebook. Sorry. Chromebook. And FPGA is much more flexible. You can put anything in there, as you can imagine. My and guess is also a extremely parallel. parallel. Yeah. You need twenty uh, FFTs, no problem. You need hundred of them, still no problem. Do that with a GPU. You, at some point, you need to reach the limit of the GPU. With your FPGAs, as long as you have space. Well, it's a trade-off. Depends on your algorithm. Yeah. Also, with the GPU, you so, could, they're so good in float, so. Like that, probably the coding effort has been simplified. I, I do agree that GPU is traditionally designed for graphics rendering and all, but to an extent, general purpose applications could benefit. Yes. So, and I mentioned uh, this morning that we, we do have a, a working group dedicated to this coprocessor problem, which is how can we make coprocessors available to us, and, it, and what, which I mean FPGAs, DSPs, GPUs, APUs, whatever other term industry comes out within the next few years. Uh, if we can kind of make a general support framework for that, it would be really nice because then, then it depends. You know, these these questions can be answered on a case by case basis, and you don't have to 
you know, focus our effort on one thing, ignoring the rest. Not really but that's our problem, which is why we have people dedicated to thinking about that. One of the things that's sort of on my to-do list that I'll probably never get around to is see if I can get something like Phosphor running on a Chromebook with an alley on it. Because um, I think that would be really cool. All right. And, uh, second question is, how, how do you do the scheduling? I mean, there's a part of code which is going to run on the ARM, and there's a part of code that's going to run on the FPGA. So how is the scheduling decided? Or is it that you've decided before writing a you know, radio application? What do you mean by, by scan? I mean, the, the thing that happens right now in your radio is your radio takes care of getting you samples and, and giving you samples. So what happens with the implementation Jonathan did with your radio is you do one mem copy. So you have periodically your work function gets called and you need a certain amount of samples. So what you would do is just uh, use one of those. I mean, either just use a read call or use the library I provided. That's the whole buffer management thing, and you just request, give me that many samples, and the FPGA will just copy I mean, the samples in there. Basically, what's going to happen is each block looks like a thread in GNU Radio, and the stuff running in the FPGA, the GNU Radio scheduler is going to treat them as threads. So it's like having extra cores. So they basically wait for data, and when they have data, the scheduler says run. And it just, it'll take care of moving the data, you know, controlling the data flow between the FPGA running it, and when it says it's finished, the Guinea Radio Schedule will then schedule the next walk. So it, it'll look like an extra core. So the more blocks you have in the FPGA, it, it looks like more cores. <coughs> Out of the synthesis, do you already have some prior experience with moving work functions from Clean Radio and generating regular code? Um, no, uh, I, I put that there because uh, Silings has this Vivado toolchain that uh, does this Vivado HLS, which apparently I, I never tried it, so that's why I put it on sort of future work. But they claim that they can take some subset of C and compile that into, into FPGA hardware so um, I know a guy who interned there who said it's actually working but, but I mean again uh, I don't know to what you I mean also on the sink it's it's pretty nice because you're not really pushing pushing the clock limit so you, I mean it, it runs at like 120 125 megahertz so you don't have to pay that much I mean it's not so hard to to get timing closure if you run the whole thing at 200 megahertz or something, it would already be a lot harder to get this with high-level synthesis probably to work. But <coughs> I mean, this is a pretty relaxed setting. This thing, also compiling the stuff is uh, really fast. So I've been using the for the last six months, uh, pretty intensively. All right, cool. Basically, it's it's the least worst. Part of the <laughs> <laughs> you, oh, you mean the least worst part of the thing that ships two different Java VMs? <laughs> We're safe. <laughs> All right. Um. Okay, now nobody move, right? Okay, so we're going to thank Moritz, and then nobody please go away, stand up or anything. Thank you, Moritz.